The governors of Cross Rivers and Benway State have ordered churches and mocks to resume activity. This is coming as coronavirus cases in Nigeria nears 7,000. The governor stated that the said the use of face masks remains compulsory for all worshippers. In Cross River going further, he disclosed that worship should be limited to their sitting capacities while hand washing and the use of hand sanitizers is a must. Is this what we need at this time? And joining us to discuss this is Mukhtar Mohammed, a political analyst via Skype, and also Pastor Wale Adefalasin, the general overseer, guiding light assembly via phone. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us tonight on the program. Thank you. Good evening, Mukhtar, and how are you doing? Doing great, are you? Fine, thank you. Pastor Wale, are you there? Good evening, sir. Yes, I am. Good evening. A pleasure having you join us again on the show. Thank you. In a statement by a special advisor on media and publicity, um, Christian Ita, Governor Ben Ayade, yesterday ordered that churches and mosques should resume activities because of spiritual economy. Now, Pastor Wale, I'm going to start with you, because I'm trying to understand spiritual economy. What does this even mean? As it only suggests to me a business terminology, a business venture. I stand corrected, if you will. Well, I, I'm also um, scratching my head here. Um, what, what does a spiritual economy mean? Um, however, let me say this. I, I don't envy governments because they have to balance between, on the one hand, fighting the pandemic, on the other hand, sustaining the economy. Uh, you know, most Nigerians live on, on, on uh, they, they earn what they live on every day. Uh, and, and then also preventing a breakdown of law and order. So I don't envy governments. However, pastors are not in the same situation. We don't have to make those choices. Uh, what the pastor has to decide is what is in the best interest of his congregation. So that even when governments say you can open your church, if the pastor judges it is not safe to do so, then he stays closed. Mokhtar, also his counterpart, the Benue State Governor, Samuel Autumn, also relaxed the lockdown of the state as it ordered churches and mocks also to reopen for activities. Now, the clamor for the reopening of religious houses has been in the public space since the inception of the lockdown. Now, what does this say about our priorities as a people? Mokhtar. <laughs> yeah, for me, it makes us feel that whether we are more religious than the Pope or than the um, Saudi Arabia, um, even in Saudi Arabia, mosques have been shut down, uh, Lysa Hajj has been suspended, and um, even they told them, the Saudi Arabia government have told even the citizens that the Eid trade that is coming up this weekend, everybody should do it in his house. But in Nigeria, you know, um, religion has become a tool for politicians to seek re-election or to seek pop popularity because they strive on the religious sentiment of Nigerians. Nigerians are very religious. Uh, most Nigerians will tell you that um, COVID-19 will be dealt with spiritually. And we've had issues where ministers come out and said um, they should open up the church because the church too can be an avenue to cure COVID-19, which I'm not doubting the church could be an avenue to cure COVID-19. But again, you need to look at the larger picture a larger picture of um, what you're about to do. If you look at even the the, um, the two states, Benue and Cross River, realize that Cross River were made to understand by the National Center for Disease Control. That is, they, they, they only did about eight tests, and that is why they pride themselves to be the state that has been COVID-free. Same thing with uh, even in Kogi State, Kogi they only State, did yeah. one. And Benue State, if you remember, Benue State have been in the news for the wrong reason since the COVID-19 incident. The lady that came out and said he was kept, nothing was given to him. The governor came out, I'm not the one keeping you. So when you look at these two scenarios, you begin to wonder, where has religion become a tool to, to gain, um, to make um, citizen to, 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 I mean, the politician to gain popularity? And then um, for governor, the governor of Cross River State, I'm not surprised. He always have a terminology to back whatever thing he, he tries to bring. I don't understand where he got what we call spiritual economy. We should understand also there's the economic side in the church. Um, that economic side has nothing to do with the pastor. Some, some of these churches are employers of labor. 
They have people that are working there day to day that are making their living there. So if you bring it to that side, you say, okay, those people, but we want to look at how much percentage of those people are really in numbers that you need to begin to use the slogan, spiritual uh, economy. All right, Pastor Wally, let me come to you now. Now, it's always been a problem of, of man, especially in a country like Nigeria, where we're pretty much religious to, to balance logic and faith. Now, do you think we should even begin to compromise the health imperative and possible implications in the light of the economy, especially in respect to religious gatherings, when it comes to the ongoing pandemic? Uh, now, uh, did you ask if, if we, we should... It's also about contributing. The line is not that clear. Now, I did say that it's always been the problem of man, especially in a country like Nigeria, where we have many religious folks, the balance between logic and faith. And in, in the light of that, should we even begin to compromise the health imperative and the possible implications in the light of the economy, especially in respect to religious gatherings as it affects the ongoing pandemic? I, I, I have... I've, I've made my position abundantly clear to, to the members of our church that we will not open our doors as a church until it is safe for them to come to church. Um, the, the, the church I read about, and I don't know how far through this is, in the Cameroon, where the pastor was invited people to come to have hands laid on them and be healed of COVID-19. And at the end of the day, the pastor died. So everybody that attends church, including the pastors, is, is subject to COVID-19. But let me make a, a, a very important point. It's the church building that is closed at the time, for the time being. The church is not closed uh, because the church is not a building, it's a people. We have been continuing as many of our activities as we can using modern technology. We don't have to be in a building. Um, we can do it from our homes. Moktal, what are the rising cases of infections from the virus? Do you think we're there just yet? Um, <laughs> this virus has come to stay with us. It will stay with us for a while. And um, somehow, somehow, we will begin to build immunity for it. Um, and that's just the truth. Until we find a permanent cure. Like I said, um, the good news about it is that it's not an African disease like Ebola or, or malaria. So it's, it's becoming a global disease. And so solution will come out early, especially for African countries. You know, you know even this issue of churches, mosques, is, is not only happening in Nigeria. Even the United States of America is California, to be precise. 1,200 churches have said that they will reopen. So it's, it's, um, it's becoming uh, a global problem because some, like Pastor Wally said, the church is not the building. The church is the person. So the person in the church, you also think about his own safety too. But in as much as you look at that also, the church itself also is um, the institution of civilization. Civilization in any society starts from, from the religious body, especially the church has been responsible for, great, for, for the movement of civilization all over the world. So, so when you look at that, then you begin to say the church also has a role to play in the economy of any nation, and which you can never take away from them. Uh, if you look at the liberation struggle all over the world, it all starts from the church. So the church could be an, in, an engine to this um, solution, solving COVID-19, because the church also could begin to teach its people, wash your hands, do this and that. That could be a solution also, because in Africa, sometimes we respect even our, our, our spiritual leaders than even our political leader here. Oh, my pastor said, oh, the imam said. So it could go a long way if we involve the, the church into the awareness towards um, safeguarding yourself as okay. regards oh, uh, COVID-19. Because finally, I remember Pastor Wally, time yeah. Let me, Pastor Wally, have... finally, now, do you think, in your opinion, that the government in any way is abdicated its responsibility to the citizens for, for a lack of active, being able to put active measures in place and what to do? I, I, I think that the government are in a very difficult position. Okay. Um, as, as you know, there was a lot of outcry 
because of the lockdown. Our people need to get to work, otherwise they couldn't feed their families. Now, government didn't do very well when it came to the, the palliatives. Uh, the palliatives didn't re actually reach as many people as, as it should have done. So I, I, I won't blame the government. Um, I believe that we all should be working together. As your other guest has just said, the church has a tremendous role to play in fighting COVID-19. Um, in, in, in terms of educating our, our people and so on and so forth. Um, so the, the, the only thing is that government should also pay a little more attention to the science. Um, and, and I think easing the lockdown on churches is a little hasty. All right. General Overseer, Guiding Light Assembly, Pastor Wale Adefawansi, it's been a pleasure having you join us on the program. Thank you very much for your contribution. Thank you very much for having me. And also thank political you. analyst Mukhtar Mohammed, thank you for your time once again. Always a pleasure. Do have a pleasant night rest. You too, Mukhtar. And thank you for staying with us. We'll take our plush report now, and when we return, I'll be giving my take. Stay with us. According to the National Human Rights Commission, over 200 cases of human rights violations by security operatives have been recorded with about 29 fatalities. This has been since the commencement of the federal government's directive on a nationwide lockdown. These abuses include physical assaults, illegal seizures, extortion and even outright destruction of property, which has caused tremendous hardship on Nigerians. The violations by law enforcement agencies, um, it, it occurs from time to time, but it's heightened during this uh, lockdown. One, it borders on um, excessive use of force, um, non-adherence to national and human rights uh, laws, um, non-adherence to rules of engagement, and um, unprofessional approach to um, service. Why Plus TV Africa investigated the conduct of security operatives? Surprisingly, some Nigerians commended their efforts but say their professionalism has been limited to only the city center. Our observation is that most uh, people are not uh, giving them cooperation because we can see a lot of uh, violation. But here in Abuja main town, there is a bit uh, good conduct compared to outskirts. Well, People will come to see this building. Where the crowd is too much, they will come and scare everybody out. Everybody will go. They won't touch up people, they won't cut people, they won't beat people. So they will just make the announcement. People are intercepted in Enugu, people are intercepted in Aba. People are also intercepted heading to Katako, all the way from Enugu. So how did they go? They passed through these security checks by giving them money. Otherwise, um, in pursuit, the security of the they are doing very well. They are trying, checkmating people and letting people go. And some of them, kind enough to talk to you, why are you on the road? Why should you not obey the lockdown? And, uh, sometimes they stay hold some people and send them back. Sometimes they let some people go. You can't be violating a law in order to enforce a law. So the only way we can go about it is Security personnel should be, should, 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 should be enlightened to know the provision of the law and to know the process of enforcement of the law. To know that at every instance you use the butt of a gun to eat a citizen, you have violated his human right. To all the human rights of every citizen in high esteem. The National Human Rights Commission, while warning that the protection of citizens by security personnel is key to avoid of a violation of their right, However, I think adherence to human rights is everybody's responsibility. It is the duty of every Nigerian to protect his right first, that of his neighbor. And if there is an infringement, there is a place the National Human Rights Commission can be alerted. We have our offices throughout the 36 states of the Federation. And I tell you, 
we have been very much alive to handling various complaints sent to us by members of the public. Idong Joseph, Plus TV, Africa. Here's my take. Doctors, nurses, carers and paramedics and essential workers around the world are facing an unprecedented workload in overstretched health facilities and with no end in sight. They are working in stressful and frightening work environments, not just because the virus is little understood, but because in most settings they are underprotected, overworked and themselves vulnerable to infection. We need a whole of society resolve that we will not let our frontline soldiers become victims of harassment and brutality by law enforcement agents. We're going to do everything to support our health workers who, despite their own well-founded fears, are stepping directly into COVID-19's path to aid the afflicted and help halt the virus spread. We must give these health workers all the respect and support they need to do their jobs, be safe and stay alive. And as much as I do want to agree and understand with the imperatives for opening the economy in the eased lockdown extension, I also think it is very ponderous to accentuate the fact that the signs of this pandemic should take the lead over any economic or spiritual business. In my contemplation, I ask, should we even begin to compromise the health imperatives and possible implications of this pandemic in the light of economic or religious gain? With the rising cases of infections from the virus, I don't think we're there just yet. And that's our show for tonight. Thank you for staying with us. Plus, politics returns tomorrow, same time. In the meantime, be safe and be well.